And three, two, one. What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo Fi Horror Guy, and welcome to another episode of the Lo Fi Horror Guys Growing on You Live. Uh, today, I'm going to have my man Matthew from 1984 Publishing on. Uh, super excited for the episode here. We're going to dig into some of the stuff he's got going on, the company's got going on. We're going to dig into, you know, just all sorts of so, all, all sorts of goods here. So let's see if I can get my man. To join. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm good, Matthew. What's going on, man? Hey. So I was trying to connect on my desktop. It's not working, so I'm on my iPhone right now. Oh, sick. Okay, me too. <laughs> it might be better. Who knows? It might be better with the audio. Yeah, okay, sweet. All right. Well, I'm glad it was working because I was like I was a little uh, worried on what was going on there. So, perfect. No, no, awesome. No. I'm looking at well, what's in your on your wall and in the behind you critters i see uh-huh yeah a, a ced friday the 13th what yeah. is that a cd a ced it was like uh like uh, uh rca's version of the uh laser discs oh uh, yeah 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 that's so cool i like the art yeah. on that uh exorcist you know the, the 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 uh actual technology was complete shit <laughs> but as far as the artwork, I love them, you know, so I've always, so, kind of, I've always held on to them. How, wh where was it playable? Did you have a special player for that? I don't remember those. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was basically, it was like RCA spin off of those and you had to have a specific player and it yeah, was okay. just, it was a pain in the ass. I mean, it wasn't, yeah, okay. it wasn't great. <laughs> it reminds me of like with, with audio CDs, I went through that whole thing where a lot of them were playable on computers for a while and then I had a lot of video CDs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Kind of the same thing. And even three-inch mm -hmm. CDs I was into for a little bit. Hell, yeah. Okay, sweet. But anyways, well, look, for, for first off, man, I, I was going to say thank you for being on. I truly appreciate it. Uh, you know, if you've never seen the show before, basically we'll have a couple of icebreaker questions. Uh, the rest of the interview is going to be on your body of work. Uh, okay. And then I have one finale that I've written just for you, Matthew. Okay, sounds good. So if you're ready, buddy, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna you know and get started on this bad boy here. Uh, if if I were to, if if we were to make a horror movie, right? And I said, yeah. Matthew, I need you to come up with the villain. I need you to you know get a monster, yeah. uh, a, a giant insect. Are we gonna do you know yeah. a serial killer vampire? What what would you make the villain of our horror movie? Um, you know what? I my favorite kind of movies touch on kind of like devils a little bit so like exorcist omen anything mm -hmm. that's maybe because i was raised catholic so like not really catholic <laughs> yeah. anymore but that whole realm i think is a little bit scarier for me than as soon as a villain sprouts wings i don't think it's scary anymore you know so yeah. i have to buy into it so anything that's like the devil's gonna get you always gets me you know rosemary's okay. baby is another one uh yeah. so even though that topic you know, they touch on it a little bit now with cults. I think that that yeah. whole genre is really smart. So, like, Hereditary. Uh, I haven't seen Midsummer yet, but I, I, I need oh, to see Oh, God. Movie. So good, man. That, no, that I know. Movie it's, on my list. it's just, like, you can't watch everything on Shudder all at once. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I, I don't know if – I think that one's on Amazon Prime. I don't think it's on Yeah, Shudder you're right. Yet. You're right. You're right. So, is uh, that good, as good as Hereditary, would you say? It's the same people, right? It's it's Ari Aster is the writer and the director. Um, it's right. not shared any you know any like actors or anything like that. But yeah, it's okay. a it's a whole different realm. You know, it's kind of like if you were to think of like Hereditary as a movie in the night, Midsummer is just this very bright, in your face all day long you know type of a horror movie, and it's it's completely different. You know, it's a different thing. Uh, but I like it as much, if not maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, you know, anything that's cultish or kind of reminds me of a really scary episode of The Twilight Zone, kind of like Get Out. Ooh, I yeah. always thought Get Out, yes. I mean, people call it a horror movie, but for me, it's like the best ever Twilight Zone episode. I, <laughs> anything that I can buy into, for me, makes it a little bit scarier. Yeah, like, can hell happen yeah. Or not? yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Have you seen The House of the Devil? I did, yeah. Great. That was that was kind of a cool uh, take on that. You know, uh, at first I didn't really appreciate it for what it was. And then I started, you know, kind of getting a little bit more into the older Italian type take and, you know, 70s stuff. And I watched it a few more times. And I'm like, oh, man, this is yeah. sweet. Yeah. Um, Any movie also that you need to watch more than once to fully get it. I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, us is like that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I saw it the first time. 
you know, there's such high expectations. And then there were so many little Easter eggs that you really need to see it mm -hmm. a second time to catch it all, which I yeah, think is cool. For sure. I think that's cool. Yeah, Midsummer hits on that as well. Ari Aster's work definitely hits on, on yeah. that on that take too. So um, cool. now if I were to ask, you know, if I were, because my wife and I do some traveling and if we yeah. were coming through Cleveland and, you yeah. know, we asked you for a local food spot, you know, where, where's a spot that we have to hit according to you? Um, I think you would like Melt. Have you heard of Melt Barn Grilled? So it's a, it's a mm -hmm. uh, grilled cheese oh, sandwich joint, and it's kind of like a punk bar. So, um, oh, sick. Every sandwich they have, there's some element of grilled cheese in it. And then, but they do crazy stuff. So, for instance, they do a breakfast club style sandwich where you get like pixie sticks on the side and you pour them on. And, like, <laughs> smash it just like in the movie so i think you'd get a kick out of that they've been on food network it's kind of a popular midwestern franchise now but oh shit um, okay i think you'd like that i mean anybody who likes horror um <laughs> i would i would recommend that so melt bar and grilled it's in it was based in lakewood ohio which is near cleveland but you can go to any location like all over ohio Oh, really? Okay. Okay. And well, you know, I'm, I'm just North, I'm in Michigan here. So, you know, I've been through Ohio plenty and, uh, uh but, you know, I like that when I have guests on when we're traveling, like the West side near Grand Rapids. Okay. Cause I go up there all the time for like concerts at in, like Detroit area. So, mm -hmm. you know, if something doesn't play Cleveland, they usually play Detroit. So that's usually my, yeah. or Columbus. So that's, that's my like concert route. Hell yeah. Okay. Sweet. Sweet. So now as far as your, your interest in horror, uh, you know, because the show is, you know, kind of primarily horror. I'll first, you know, touch on that. Where where did your interest start? Where where were the origins for it? Yeah, you know, um, I had parents that were kind of cool about it. It's it funny when you're raised Catholic, it's like, for some reason, nudity's bad. And then horror is kind of OK. So I remember being <laughs> I remember being like seven and I was allowed to go into the horror section and rent whatever I wanted to, you know, so. Oh, shit. And my parents were cool about, like, at that age, I knew it was fake, but I liked being scared. So they were okay with me renting, like, a Friday the 13th part, one, two, three, four, five, you know? So I yeah. grew, okay. grew up on horror, and I was watching it way before I should have been watching it, probably. And, you know, whatever you watch, I, I always think, like, whatever you watch around your, like, preteen years is what you stick with or what nostalgically you stick with you know i don't care if it's a movie yeah 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 or whatever it's like the, mm -hmm. so for instance i like the goonies i saw the theater at age whatever 10 <laughs> and for any friend that i introduced it to in the last couple of years they don't like it it's, you have to be raised in it i think like for them it's too wow, okay. drawn out or it's not as good as what they heard so i always think oh, that yeah. uh, same thing with horror i think that whatever you whatever franchise you grew up with i think you stick with and then once a year, there's like one breakthrough movie that I think's really good, like Hereditary or mm. even Babadook or whatever, that they have to kind of win me over. You know, uh, sure. I've seen so many horror movies that I have to hear about it like three, four times before I see it. And then usually I like it, you know, but I, I'm really <laughs> stubborn now. I, I don't watch everything that's new. I, I have right. to hear about it a lot to watch it. But anyways, your question was, how did you get hooked? You know, I, I was hooked as an early kid. And okay. I remember when Fox began, the first couple of weeks that Fox began, they would show kind of unedited movies. And I remember watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre on Fox. Um, oh my God. <laughs> unedited. I don't know what they were doing, but it was unedited. And I was <laughs> probably like eight. And I was just like instantly hooked into movies like that. And then they stuck with me for a while. Damn. Okay. I could not imagine watching that movie. The first time no, I saw it, it I was oh, it's supposed to shit. be hanging out at friends and it literally made me physically sick. I was no, probably too scary. young watching uh, it. <laughs> but you know what? I still had my boundaries. Like I still have never seen to this day um, Faces of Death. Oh, okay. And that was the kind of movie that you would watch at like a sleepover and someone would rent it. And mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. So to me, in my mind, even as a mid 40 year old it still sticks with me as like this movie that it's beyond the pale and i can't watch it so, <laughs> probably, I probably better that cheesy, way but 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was like, I think the later 90s, they came out with a lot of the videos were actually fake, too. So I think that yeah, helps yeah. out a little bit of it, you know, but still, you know, being before that time and not knowing that it was uh, that was d definitely a hard thing to get through. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if, if you could say three, uh, three scenes from any and I'll even say, you know, sci fi, uh, fantasy or horror, three scenes that have just embedded in your brain forever. Yeah. What what would you what would you say are three scenes? You know it's funny I I dislike and like a lot of those seventies movies where it's like this three hour movie and then there's a payoff ending but that payoff ending is so good sometimes like so for me the ending of Rosemary's Baby mm -hmm. um, that last scene where she kind of finds the crib is horrified but then you you kind of end the movie where maybe she joined that cult like right. to me that was that was a great scene. And if that mm -hmm. scene didn't exist, the whole movie wouldn't be good, you know? Sure. So yeah. that's a great scene, horror-wise. Um, the Texas Chainsaw, oh God, what scene though in that is scary? Probably the, oh God. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of scenes in that movie, but probably the escape is, is, is a great scene for me that's kind of embedded. I mean, that movie okay. has like six scenes that are embedded, you know, like the chase with the chainsaw, uh, the very last scene where she's kind of escaping and is like delirious, I think is kind of creepy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so then moving on, one more. God, let's see, let me just think of what pops in my mind. Um, oh, the last scene in The Omen also, you oh, know, where, yeah. you know, I wanted him to kill that kid, even though kids, <laughs> I mean, the rule is kids never get killed, but right. you, you so want him to get killed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, funny enough, though, there's other scenes that, you know, like Good Kills and Friday the 13th, but they don't stick with me as much because um, they're not as believable. They're just like cool or crazy or funny. So mm -hmm. anything that's believable sticks with me a little bit more like, oh, shit, this can happen. So Exorcist, sure. like the entire Exorcist last 20 minutes is really good. Yeah. Um, even though I don't really say, I, I, for me, 80s horror is better than 70s horror. But the, if you're asking for individual scenes, those movies had real good payoff scenes. Sure, sure. Okay. I, I, you know, I can, I can love that. And all those, I mean, all those are definitely classics. And, you know, some of those things are attributes to those being, you know, such. So I can, yeah. uh, I can, I can certainly agree to those selections. Um, so now, you know, some, so. Moving on years later, you have 1984 Publishing. What was yeah. the, uh, what, what, where did that all start? Uh, what was, you know, right. some er earlier projects that uh, kind of pushed this off the ground? Yeah. So I had a white collar job for 15 years. And um, during that time, I was writing on the side some mm -hmm. books on my own. So I wrote three books. The first one was called Put the Needle on the Record. It was an 80s cover art book. Uh, and then I wrote uh, two books on alternative movie posters, alternative movie posters one and two. Mm -hmm. And I released those right on the kind of forefront of Mondo and even before Waxwork started mm -hmm. and loved it. And then I started getting, getting into that scene a little bit. So I was going to show signing those books. So I was going to like at the time, Wizard World was kind of popular and some of the horror shows, and I totally loved it. But I didn't make a lot. You, don't, you realize real fast as an author, um, you can't make a ton. You know, you kind of have to have yeah. other things going on. And that's why I started the company. So with 1984, you know, initially it was just books and it was books that I wanted to buy. And then now we're getting into more uh, soundtracks as well. Um, mm -hmm not just horror we might try some other things i don't want to ruin anything but you know um sure. the horror market's been pretty gutted you know as far as soundtrack releases so we want to take it we want to find some more horror releases but take it to another level and do some other genres as well um but that that might not be horror but that might be appreciated by horror fans still sure let's okay just, let's just say that i have a really cool title i can't announce that's coming out for black friday record store day um, and the artwork is by gary pullen and uh i can't announce it because that list just isn't out yet but it's really really good for this uh, year or next year this year for black friday so it should be announced um i think in october they're going oh, live with that shit. list. 
So nice. it's gonna be really good. Okay. You'll you'll like it. So I mean, for, you know, in in stepping into you know, because you were kind of saying there's there's a little bit of you know different routes going out too. Uh, you have the new uh, is it black and white and weird all over? Yeah. So we're trying some different things. You know, I want to get into yeah. music books more. Okay. And the first one that came to the table is this weird Al book. So basically, his drummer's name is John Bermuda Schwartz. Yeah. Uh, they recently found like all these contact sheets from 80 to 83 to 86. And it's, it was thousands of these black and white images that they took of kind of behind the scenes of his first few videos and first few albums. And then they came to me, John came to me and said, you know, like, hey, you know, we heard of 1984, you know, we like some of your books, we'd like to put out a photo essay on this period, would you be interested? And of course, I was interested. The first cassette I ever bought was Weird Al's first <laughs> album. So, oh, yeah. You know, for me, I mean, even though I'm into horror, I'm into other stuff, too. And oh, yeah. that was uh, a great title that came our way. What I want to do, though, is now use that title and approach other bands that I like and say, like, all right, um, you know, we want to do, do you have any photography or would you like to do a book? And my dream is to have these books kind of replace programs and become band merch at shows. Uh, I think that would be cool. Hell um, yeah. Because I bought, I bought plenty of programs over the years and it's like that thing where you're at a concert and you either buy, you have like 50 bucks to you know dump off and you either buy a t-shirt or you buy a program. And then the t-shirt you wear and then the program you just like throw in your closet. So <laughs> I, I think it would be cooler to do kind of a smaller hardbound kind of a zine kind of thing for bands. Okay. Maybe it'll be like a $25 thing. And um, that's my dream to kind of move into that direction as well. So, you know, I have that in the hopper and then Planet Wax is coming out too that I mm -hmm. know you had Shane on and- yep. uh, Jeff and Aaron. Jeff and Aaron. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm all about soundtracks, anything that touches horror, but also sci-fi, even like, 80s comedies I'm big into and I feel like that hasn't been uh, pushed as much as horror and sci-fi but I think it's, yeah, the, the okay. same, it's the same audience all the way around Right, right. And there's lots of hand in hand stuff too, especially in the 80s that, you know, might touch a little bit with the sci fi or like, you know, a couple of scarier parts, but you know, is primarily a, a, a comedy movie that I think would would generate some interest in something like that. Yeah, like even like a cabin in the woods kind of thing, you know, it's yeah, I think yeah. that horror is going in a new direction where it's not just slashers. I think slashers still sell like the new Halloweens are going to be huge hits. But anything that kind of it's kind of like country music. It's like, it's pop music. You know what I mean? Like Taylor Swift yeah. isn't country really, but any horror genre that crosses over and has a little bit of comedy in it, I think is really smart. Yeah, hell yeah. Okay. And actually Nightmare on Elm Street did that first. You know, Nightmare on Elm Street, sl it's a slasher thing, but I mean, they really pushed the boundaries of comedy, I think towards the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Part, or they were part two like, was a whole different angle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I did that. I helped with that book. Movie. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen or wait, you have what? the documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. on uh -huh. Nightmare on Elm Street too? Yeah, I was a. I helped with that. I was um, a producer in that, and then oh no shit, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then I helped bring the artwork to the table because because of alternative movie posters, the book. I know a lot of the artists, so I brought Matt Ryan Tobin to the table, who did the poster oh, okay. art for it. Yeah, wow. So, Damn, you know, I'm embarrassed. I shouldn't have known that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's fine. No, I, Damn, I, I, that's I, sick. I don't know. I try to just dabble in lots of different things and see, sees what, you know, see what sticks. But um, sure. it all touches on the same thing, which is nostalgia. And I feel like mm -hmm. nostalgia horror is the most hardcore fan even though there's lots of comic cons all over the place the horror base mm -hmm. and the music base are the two strongest bases sci-fi is very oh, yeah. strong but it's very segmented so it's like you're a marvel fan or you're a dc fan and then you like star wars or star trek whereas i think with horror if you're a horror fan you kind of watch it all and you you see what's mm -hmm. out there so like even though you might be mm -hmm. a slasher fan you kind of watch still all the zombie movies and you see if you like them or hate them. Uh, you pour right. through Shudder. I think it's different for comedy you know, fans and for sci-fi fans. Horror fans are the, I think, most ardent 
group. Um, I don't know. I go to a lot <laughs> okay. of horror conventions and people have the deepest pockets there. It's unreal. Like they'll stand in line all day long to just meet, meet one of the kills from Friday the 13th. You know, it, it's unreal. You know? <laughs> right, right, and right. these that people is, come to these crazy. shows, you know, I'll talk to these people and these people will come to these shows like they didn't even know they had fans until they came to one of these shows. And, you know, they, right. they were on set for one day. They're not even an actor. And then suddenly they're making, you know, 10,000 in a weekend signing because they were nurse, the nurse zombie in Dawn of the Dead, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I think that is cool. crazy. Holy shit. Hell yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly like the huge, the huge fan base out there too. And, uh, you know, and it's something where us, you know, as, as fans, uh, appreciate the stuff that, that you do and, you know, the stuff that Jeff and, and Aaron have been putting out and, you know, just all that physical media that comes along with the, you know, the side notes of obvious, you know, movies and DVDs and such, uh, we can appreciate this stuff. So well, uh, you know what's great? absolutely. Um, Thank I, you. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What's great also is, and you probably know this in the, like the Instagram podcast world. It's a small, even though it's a big fan base, it's a small, it's still small. Yeah, like yeah. so, I've worked with Michael Michael Gingold a few times. He was a former editor in chief of Fangoria. He did Ad Nauseum for me and Ad Nauseum Two, and nice. he's attached to so many little projects. Like he's attached to Arrow Video and Vinegar Syndrome, oh, and okay. he wrote the about liner notes for the forthcoming Friday the Thirteenth like Shop Factory box set. You know, so nice. Everybody like cobbles together like their own little freelancing career. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can't just be connected to one company anymore. You kind of have to pimp yourself all over the place. Yeah, sure. Well, and, and you know, even artists, you know, um, somebody like yeah, Shane yeah, Lewis yeah. or, you know, some of the other cats that are out there that do, you know, you see that they might do like a cover for Vinegar Syndrome, but then they might have something for Shout Factory. And that's always a really cool thing, too. You know, there are a lot of subgenres that come along with uh, the whole horror community. So it's a very cool. Yeah, thing. yeah. It's like Gallery 1988 is great. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll do horror one week and then Paul Rubens the next week and then UHF <laughs> the next week. And it's all the same fans. You know, I, I know yeah. that everybody keeps talking about horror, which is, I think, the base of it. But they mm. all kind of also like Police Academy and all this other <laughs> tangential stuff, you know? Yeah. And that's the kind of direction I think that there's still a lot of untapped movies, even though it's like every soundtrack Under the Sun has been re-released on video and on vinyl, there's still more. And that's what's sure. exciting about it for me. Sure, okay. So tell me about the name 1984 Publishing. What was, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Where, where did that come from? Yeah, so 1984, it's my favorite year for entertainment. So not only horror movies, but even music. And there's something about that year for me. If you look at lists of things that came out year by year in the 80s, 84 for mm -hmm. me is still my favorite year. So 84 and 85, actually. So there's so much that came out around that period, even like Children of the Corn and uh, Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. I know some of those are like 83, 84, 85, but that period for me was period, really right. strong and ripe for just cool shit that was coming out. But also I kind of like the year 1984 in terms of like Big Brother and the book 1984, you know, so okay. yeah. it's a double edged sword there, but I, it's my favorite year for entertainment. That's usually what I go with, but the book is oh, also yeah. really good. And I think the whole Big Brother is watching you, you know, 1984 topic, it's, it's ripe nowadays. Like everybody seems to be believing in conspiracy <laughs> theories. And I'm not saying I believe in all that, <laughs> but I, I don't know what it is, but we're getting back in that zone a little bit of no one yeah. believes anybody and media is terrible. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a weird uh, period right now. I'm not tying it to one person, but it's like a trend, you know, and I think we'll go the opposite way. That's usually how it goes where right. like, it's like a pendulum effect. Yeah. 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 It goes right wing, left wing, right wing, left wing. And then, you know, most people are in the center, mm -hmm. but um, that's part of it too. So I thought that was kind of cool to embed in the logo. Um, you know, with, with, introducing somebody you know new that might not you know know anything about the company or you know might not know any of the products or something what is yeah. what is your go-to for you know hey i've got i've got this check this out yeah usually it's for me it's like nostalgia I, I i hate to use one word but it's like 
pop culture and it's nostalgic and it's horror and it's music. It's things you like to do <laughs> in a hardbound coffee table format. I might mm -hmm. get more into different kinds of format, but at the beginning, at least, the business card is it's it's cool coffee table books. It's pop. I hate to use the word pop culture because I feel like that's kind of like a frivolous term nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, pop, yeah, that I mean... means Backstreet Boys. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about <laughs> no. it's just like things you want to buy and watch. But the whole nostalgic yeah. angle, it's a whole undertone that was, I think, ignored for a while. And maybe Criterion kickstarted that like where okay yeah you know when you when you're reaching back to an old in shop factory maybe when you're reaching back to an old movie not only do they want a clean picture but they want to know everything about it they want easter eggs they want little documentaries they want old interviews they want trailers radio mm -hmm. spots i want to do that in book form i want to do that with documentaries i want to do that with even the the vinyl releases that i'm doing sure. i want to take it to another level like people want not only the soundtrack, but they want unheard demos. They want maybe some pieces to be signed. They want they want to take that fandom to another level, and that's what I'm trying to mm -hmm. do for them, and also affordably. You know, I don't want to uh, rip anybody's pocket. You know, I always want to stay in the like twenty-five to thirty-five dollar range, which is pretty okay. good for uh, three pound, four pound. Reachable. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And, you know, I think I'll always try to push it in new directions. Box sets right now for books are really popular. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to meet the needs of what people want. You know, a lot of people don't just want a photo essay. They want it to be signed. They want actual photos inside that they can frame. Sure. Um, they want film cells, you know, so I try to push the boundaries of what a book can be. I think yeah, that's, yeah. and that's what Aero video and that's what Mondo and everyone's moving in the same direction of like, all right, there's lots of hardcore fans that really like Halloween. Mm -hmm. How can we present this in a new way and not just re-release the film yet again? Right, um, right. I talked to recently Clark Collis from Entertainment Weekly. And, hmm. you know, he said one of his most famous pieces on entertainmentweekly.com was an oral history of just the scene from Mike Myers where he tilts his head a little bit. And <laughs> like, Damn. You know, like that's, that's where we're getting to. You know, we've seen that yeah. movie over and over and over. So it's like an oral history on the sweater that was worn or you know, so he just talked to Nick Castle and some other people from the movie, not even Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, and uh -huh. that piece did better than mainstream pieces on a new Marvel movie, you know, so it's crazy yeah. where fans like a movie so much that there's always one more story you can tell. Or there's like, sure. okay, okay. Jamie Lee Curtis is popular, but you know, let's talk to that gaffer or let's talk to the sound person that has like, one more unearthed story that you've never heard before that's cool as shit so you know yeah. i don't know okay i feel like with these books i'm always trying to not only get to the elvira and weird al and the expected people i'm trying to get to like the background singers everybody's got one more story and usually the stories with the artists are pretty strong and um like the poster artists and usually those people are mm -hmm. never talked to so when i did um Put the Needle on the Record, which was an 80s cover art book. Uh, I talked to mm -hmm. over 125 musicians and cover artists. The cover artists had better stories than the musicians. You know, so Damn. David Lee Roth mm -hmm. has been telling for 10 years or 20 years that he was the kid on the 1984 cover. And then you talk to the cover <laughs> artist and she's like, no, that was my son. And I gave him chocolate cigarettes. And, <laughs> and we, we posed all day. So it's funny how you know, the more people you talk to, you get to the real story. So it's fun. Sure. Okay. Okay. You know, and, and it's cool. I mean, it, that kind of touches on like when I first reached out to you, you know, I had mentioned, hey, I'm going to have Jeff on the show. I'm going to have Aaron on the show. I'm yeah, really interested yeah. in the company and all the stuff that you guys are doing. You're like, you know, I mean, if you if you feel like, you know, you, I could I could contribute something. I'm like, yeah, dude, I mean, you're putting out awesome shit. Of course, I want to hear your story. You know, no, like, it's I funny, you know, all the stuff that you guys are doing. It's like when I authored books, I got 
you know, everybody wants to get as close to the topic as possible. So I think a lot of people look at the publisher as like, ah, you know, they're just like bankrolling it or just doing the business side of it. But I'm as interested in these titles as Aaron and Jeff are. And, you know, I poured, half of those sleeves, not half of those sleeves, but probably 20% of those sleeves came from my collection. And, you know, we all contribute in the way that we need to. So, you know, I have yeah, a thousand pieces of vinyl, just like Aaron and Jeff do. And I'm as big of a fan as everybody, you know, on these topics. So let's dig into your, your most recent, well, I shouldn't say your most recent, you did have the Weird Al one come out too. And I, I wasn't really uh, all that aware of that one coming out, but. Well, that uh, one, this, this, okay, so that one comes out in October, October 27th. Uh, oh, so that one's oh not, okay. Yeah, so that one's not out yet. Even Planet Wax, it comes out on Record Store Day. Yeah. The, the first Record Store Day drop, they're called. So mm -hmm. that's August 29th, which is next week. I'm excited about that. That was delayed since April. So it is like, it was funny with that book. It was like a hurry up and wait kind of thing because of COVID. So yeah. we had that ready to go in April and we were going crazy around the holidays trying to finish it. And then it's been in the can for, you know, six months, but uh, that's a great <laughs> book. Hell yeah. Well, that, that was what I was going to get into. Yeah, My man, the old planet wax dude. So let, let's just, you know, kind of hear on, I know, uh, Jeff and Aaron, you know, their, their, their first kind of take on this was uh, Blood on Black Wax. This was oh, the sequel, Black if you will. Black yeah, he is. He's, he's commenting <laughs> and all. He's shouting out all, the, all these Got amazing 1984 movies. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just from, from, from your recollection, what were some of the earlier conversations on, on the sci-fi and fantasy being the, the next level to this? We did Blood on Black Wax. It sold out immediately for Record Store Day last year. Mm -hmm. And big hit. Um, a lot of people couldn't get it. So they just, you know, bought the regular edition, of course. And then, uh, you know, we started talking. It was a lot of fun to do. And then we thought, like, what do we do? You know, we even talked about, like, is there enough to do a sequel? And there's not. You know, so, you know, there, the whole point of the book is it has to be released on vinyl. So we're not covering CDs, you know, uh, like Children of the Corn or whatever may have been released on CD and not on vinyl. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next natural step was, especially with Jeff, Jeff was a big sci-fi fantasy fan and that was our next logical step. And also there was enough material to put into a whole book. I mean, we could have done a sequel book to Blood and Black Wax, but it would have been, I guess we would have dug more into either 50s, 60s or just done all current horror. Um, but it wasn't meaty enough, you know, mm -hmm. um, that would have been more like, 100 pages or you know something <laughs> smaller so sci-fi they convinced me sci-fi and fantasy was the way to go they were both interested enough to totally dig through their collection and there's a lot of sci-fi titles that are kind of horror you know like mm -hmm. more that are at least appreciated by that same base like so there's a huge section on mad max conan you know so there's a lot of titles in there that okay yeah are they, first of all, are they really even sci-fi or what genre are they? You know, they're a little bit horror, they're a little bit sci-fi, they're a little bit just drama, you know? And, but they're yeah. all appreciated. Every horror fan that I know loves Mad Max Fury Road. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's in the same ballpark. So that's, yeah. that's where we yeah, started. Absolutely. We made a list. Um, some titles had to go because maybe one of the three of us liked him, but not all three. Uh, <laughs> you know, it can get pretty specific, just like with horror. Yeah. You know, are we, how deep do we go? You know, and are we putting in titles that we only like just because we covered 250 more titles? Same thing right. with sci-fi. You know, you can go on and on and on, uh, you know, and dig more and more and more. So there's about 250 titles, but, you know, there's a thousand to pick from. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, know, did, were, were there others that didn't end up making the cut that you didn't decide yeah, to use? Yeah, You know, so we made the cutoff in the 90s for sci-fi because we felt that Marvel and DC was sci-fi. And if we went that realm, it would have been like half the book suddenly would be about... So I'm going to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> never going to stop. So we made the cutoff at 99. So we included, so for instance, Batman, Batman Returns, things like that. But and even Dick Tracy, but we didn't go into X-Men. It, it, it would get way out of hand, you know. Right. Um, 
there's just too much material because right now, even with Star Wars, it's like one picture per year, two pictures per year. Then suddenly mm -hmm. you have to devote, if you're doing a, a cover per page, suddenly it, it takes over the book and sure. um, it becomes a Marvel book or a DC book. So yeah, yeah, we cut it, yeah. We cut it off. Okay. So basically it's seventies, eighties and nineties. And, and, you know, I can, I can touch on too, you know, there was really specific titles that I thought, you know, that I would see as far as like Star Wars and, and some of the, uh, you know, if, if you were to get into like more horror sci-fi, like Galaxy of Terror and different things, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Barry yeah. Schrader uh, interview was awesome. I, yeah. you know, I really love cool. those. Uh, what was the process as far as reaching out to some of those people? And, uh, you know, what was it kind of a, kind of a going back and forth or was it a pretty smooth yeah. uh, process? I mean, we tried to reach out to as many as possible. I mean, we found out with Blood and Black Wax, people wanted more interviews. So Jeff, especially, he grabbed about 20 interviews for the book. You know, we started with the composers. Usually the composers were really good about being interviewed because they're rarely interviewed. I mean, I'm not talking Danny mm -hmm. Elfman and, you know, a couple other big guys. <laughs> right, right. No, but like, you know, Barry and um, there's so many that, did a lot of series that you know maybe they didn't win an oscar so their names are not out there as much as like goldstein and some others so uh jeff went pretty crazy but he was really creative if he couldn't get the composer or if the composer died you know he would find like so for instance for um god what was the soundtrack metropolis maybe you know we got okay. billy squire and a couple mm -hmm. of the musicians that just recorded on that album you know right. because some soundtracks are scores and then some are song soundtracks like my best example is like footloose it's all songs all the way through you know <laughs> so if it's a soundtrack like that we try to find one of the musicians uh, or huey lewis or whoever to interview and then if not we try the composer or the director or just someone that was close to the music Sure. And, okay. You know, we did get some directors. We did get Richard Donner, for instance. He did, okay. you know, some of the Supermans. He did, uh, God. Did he do Goonies as well? You know, we, we try to be inventive about and, and give a variety. If you talk to too many composers, that's also not so great sometimes because they get really into how the composition was created which is interesting oh. to some, but not others. Yeah, um, right. If you talk to the musician, like, so for my book, uh, 80s book, I talked to OMD and Annie Lennox and all these types. They offer a different flavor than the composer would offer. If you talk to mm -hmm. the cover artist, they give you a little bit different slice as well. If you talk to the director who chooses the composer sometimes, they'll give you their laundry list of who they tried to get and didn't get. You know, so... <laughs> Each interview offers a little bit different, but Jeff was the spearheading the interviews. He was really great about nice. You know, if you, if you contact fifty people, you get twenty five, and he was good about kind of going. Shout nice. out Jeff, yeah. Yeah. Shout out Jeff. <laughs> yeah. And, and and my, point, my point was getting. Oh uh, yeah, Shane, what's up, buddy? Uh, <laughs> my my point was going to uh, you know talking about as well you know like with with some of the more movies that I thought that I would see in the book. But the cool thing about these two is like you know looking through this, I I stumble upon like something like Harry and the Hendersons, and then yeah. you guys have the the Bruce yeah. Bolton uh, interview, and I'm just like, oh shit, I love that yeah. movie. Like you yeah, know, so you know we try to include we have like this family chapter which sounds completely lame, but these are movies you watch as a kid. So oh yeah, <laughs> so cool. We couldn't leave out, even though it's more fantasy. Actually, we started in pure sci-fi, and we mm -hmm. ended up doing some fantasy titles. So horror fans also grew up on Never Ending Story, Labyrinth, things like that. And yeah. is that sci-fi? Is it fantasy? Is it a musical? What? You know? So we right. had to put it in. It's right. got a cool cover, so why not? And it's David Bowie, you know? Yeah. Uh, right. So for some of the... Uh, soundtracks yeah we did dive into movies you might have liked as a kid which also might be star wars you know or empire yeah. strikes back so it's right. really hard to do a cutoff um and also don't forget like we had a sci-fi horror chapter in blood and black wax yep. so since we included alien in blood and black wax we didn't want to double dip for anybody right. that bought that book so there are a couple titles that you think oh is that sci-fi is that horror like it's in one of those two books um 
but uh, you know, sometimes it's that big argument with Alien: is it a horror movie or is it a sci-fi movie? Sci-fi, so, right. <laughs> yeah, we included it in the first book, so we labeled it horror, and we can't put it in the second book. As far as you and you know, pitching saying, "Hey, we're doing a sci-fi fantasy book. I I have to have these movies in it." What were a couple of movies that you know were were your inspiration to be like? We have to include this. Oh, you know, for me, I'm all about bad movies. So I'm always, <laughs> okay. no, I'm always pushing, like, of course, Star Wars, Star Trek, like that was already on their list, but I pushed them. Mm. I don't know if I pushed them or not, but like, for me, something shitty like Xanadu has to go on. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, ELO, yeah. ELO is a great band. So uh, even if you hate the movie, the music's kind of good. <laughs> uh, so how do you not include that like you can't make judgment you know so um harry and the hendersons was a big discussion um xanadu was another discussion even back to the future like is that really sci-fi or what but we thought yeah right it was sci-fi enough and fans would like it and that that's yeah. it is it a it could sure. be, you know is it a straight-up comedy i don't know but um it was sci-fi enough for us and it went in and first you know that sure. pop, we had a pop chapter and what we did was we paired the album with one of the singles from the albums so that drove a lot of the content you know so um metropolis is in there xanadu's in there oh even uh you want to talk about a shitty bad but pretty good movie <laughs> the apple have you ever heard of no okay look it up it's like is that a band or the movie? It's a movie called The Apple, and it's this German sci-fi movie. They put millions of dollars into it, and they thought it was going to be a huge hit. It's kind of on Xanadu level, bad. And <laughs> it's in there, and it's so bad. But if you've seen the movie, it's got to be in there. You know. Okay. Is it a so white cover, the album? The album is in there, and uh, it's, it's, there's a big-ass apple on the cover. Uh, it's a, <laughs> okay. it's okay. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that for some reason. No, no, no. Just uh, you don't even have to watch the whole thing. Just watch the trailer, and you'll know why we put it in there. But <laughs> we try to include. Okay. We always try to include some movies that you haven't heard of that we think are kind of iconic in a bad way. And mm -hmm. yeah, reviewers might say, "Why is the apple in there? It's the worst movie ever." But that's why we included it. Like, why you, yeah. you can't, you know, it's like sleepaway camp and stuff like that. You know, they right. all have their fan base. You know, you, right. I need to include stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's like in horror, you know, when, when you talk to certain people and they ask about sequels and I'm like, look, return to the return of the killer tomatoes is probably one of my favorite sequels of all time. If not my yeah, favorite. And people Moody's just look it. at me like I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's that movie is just line after line of greatness. I mean, for me, there should be a whole book, or maybe it's just a pamphlet, on, like, shitty horror movies starring legitimate <laughs> actors. So, like, Big actors? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Texas Chainsaw, The Next uh, Generation, has two Oscar winners in it. Matthew but, McConaughey, yeah. yeah and that's crazy, that? crazy. Yeah, and I know they tried to, like, years. stuff it in the toilet, but uh, it's so bad, you gotta watch it. Same thing with Dennis Hopper and Texas 2. I'm not a huge fan of Texas Chainsaw 2. I, I'm sure there's more fans than not for me i love the original so much it just didn't work and i think people back into it's a great movie because of certain reasons but i hated it i i'm sorry but i own it yeah but I, okay <laughs> okay like i watch it every yeah. couple of years like can i can i still get through it and <laughs> i try i try to understand it and i never quite get through it but um yeah, yeah. also in that category leprechauns things like that you know Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's crazy, actually, is that I've always, you know, I've, I've liked those movies. They're, they're fine. And, like, the first one has, uh, oh, man, what's her name? Uh, Je yeah, Jennifer, from, uh, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston's in it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just kind of funny. I mean, as far as that would be an absolutely amazing idea. I think that would be, that'd be <laughs> such a great book. Or, I'm sure it's been done as, a, like, a news article. But George Clooney's in Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Um there's oh 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 we're forgetting about return the to uh what's that movie uh, called uh, uh, the burning has um oh yeah it has uh what's her name i think helen hunt's in it and yeah. jason alexander yeah, yeah so i mean yeah. there's so many everybody started off some light oh, bulbs 
Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Uh, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Yeah. I just yeah. read an article with Kevin Bacon. He said he's not pissed, but he's, he said no matter what movie he does, like Footloose and all these other good movies, everybody asks about Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. And then everybody <laughs> brings him movie stills of him with that like spear coming through his neck. And, you know, he, he may have been even nominated for an Oscar. Who knows? But like, no matter what you do, it's all about Friday 13th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to be able to get away from that. No. no. I was, no. was going to say, Return to Horror High. Does, is George Clooney in that one? Am I, am I thinking right? Um, you ever watched that movie? that movie? I forget if he's in that movie. I feel like he was in that one too. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's, that's such a cool idea. I mean, just to have like all, you know, possibly some of the shittiest movies ever that, you know, the breakout actors, you know, cut, cut, you know, cut their teeth in, so to speak. Yeah, actually, I mean, you could expand that if it's not just horror, then every actor has been, every actor that won an Oscar was in a shitty movie. Nicole Kidman, oh, yeah. everybody, all the way down. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was yep. in that, do you remember, was, was it a BMX movie or something like that? I mean, everybody's been oh, in yeah. some shitty indie 80s or 70s movie all the way down the line um i was just chatting with a friend you know like uh mommy dearest you know like one of the worst movies ever the daughter in that movie <laughs> who kind of killed her career who was in psycho 3 she was nominated for an oscar like it, it goes it's like you're nominated Crazy. for an oscar you you do one bad movie and then suddenly you're on the horror circuit or you start in the horror <laughs> it's like you start in the horror circuit and you, then you you die in the horror circuit <laughs> yeah right 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 yeah there like, are some actors too that end up just getting stuck in uh, you know the same type of roles or you know different things too so i mean what i like that's what double i double like sided about sword that's what i like about rob zombie like i don't love all his movies you know like even the the current ones don't do it for me i do i just saw him mm. in concert you know, I do like him. I like his early stuff, but he he's great. He's like the Quentin Tarantino of horror movies where he tried to revive the careers of like a D Wallace who, you know, was yeah. in E.T. E and, you know, then suddenly, Cujo. She was in, suddenly she was in popcorn like three years later. I don't know. And Cujo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how what happens, but I don't know if it's bad agents or I mean, I like her a lot and she's really nice if you ever meet her. But um mm -hmm. It's that weird cycle where you you have some failures, but the horror community will always appreciate you no matter what. I think that's what's yeah, cool about sure, horror. Yeah, for sure. Like everybody looks at these horror shows as like a joke, you know, if you don't go to them. And it is mm -hmm. the nicest group of people that you'll meet. And there, I think the 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 tether like that goes through it is that we were all outcasts in some way you know liking horror either you were a stoner or you're a gay guy or you, you weren't the sports guy usually you know usually right. like those were the guys that were super popular in high school and everybody else was an outcast in some way and all those people are horror fans you know <laughs> so i love <laughs> these shows because it's it's you know it's like revenge of the nerds or something it, it's the sure. It's like, but it, it, society is flipped where geeks and stoners and all these outcasts um, are now respected in a different way. But in high mm -hmm. school, they were outcasts. And now if you're like a geeky kid and you make robots, you're super cool. But right. you, weren't, <laughs> right. you weren't in 1982. You Not know? at that time, were, no. <laughs> no, no. That's what I love about this whole era. It's like, I also go to New York Comic Con and have a booth. And it's like 250,000 geeks that <laughs> were bullied that made it. Now they're all doctors and lawyers and all this stuff, you know? Right. So, right. I know. It's like, so, you know, it's like, the, it, it's like the art of, you know, uh, of just getting an old swirly, getting your head dunked in a toilet. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. thing is gone. That, 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 that's, that, those days are over with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't do that. But uh, I was uh, yeah. chatting with Aaron. I was chatting with Aaron recently. Like, I also like all those comedies from the '80s, like Porky's or whatever. And they get a not a bad rap, but you know, there's a lot of uh, not PC stuff in that. 
But if you're raised on those movies, I still think Revenge of the Nerds, okay, there's a lot of bad stuff oh, in it. But, but as a nerd, you know, you identify with a movie like that. So I still, mm. it's still one of my favorite movies, even though, yeah, they wouldn't make it in the same way nowadays, you know, as they did back then. But I think it's hilarious. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, and I mean, it's just kind of, it, it's a little bit of a difference, you know, in just the culture nowadays, you know, as far as like nowadays it being kind of like, a, you know, you get a trophy whether you win or you lose, you know, type yeah. of thing. You know, I, I, I really do wish time, like time and time again that that would kind of go away and it would go back to, you know, like bust your ass and, you know, you're going to make it, you know, make sure that you're, you're going to do what yeah, you're going to do yeah. and you're going to come out on top, you know. Yeah. yeah, that's part of it. I think the whole PC thing goes back and forth also. You know, mm -hmm. when I released Ad Nauseum, I was a little bit nervous because we, we showed every newspaper ad from 80 to 89. And Crazy. A lot of cool stuff, but a lot of, like, exploitation. And obviously, they ran the gamut. Like, sometimes women were exploited. Sometimes African Americans were exploited. Some, I mean, everybody was exploited in some way. Skinny right. guys were exploited you know everybody latinos uh so it was weird showing some of these ads that were totally not pc anymore but it is i don't want to say it is what it is but it it's the history of what it was so right. i'm not going to whitewash that era you know it, it shows the good and the bad of yeah okay there wouldn't be any more x-rated and exploitation ads anymore in mainstream newspapers but there right. were they existed and that's you know, when you're doing a reference guide, you have to include all that. And you know, you're going to get in trouble for some of it, but you can't leave it out, you know, right, right. Or like, you know, I mean, just having like a high school, you know, history book, and it only gives, you know, like one third of actually, you know, like, it's like, okay, this is what we're going to teach you. And this is yeah, what, you know, yeah, what yeah. happened. It's like, no, 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 let's go back and look at this a little bit. So I well, mean, you can appreciate like that. Guys, for me, it's like there are some really uncomfortable horror movies like Last House on the Left is one. Yeah. And then the other yeah. one is um, what's the uh, God? Uh, I Spit on Your Grave, you know, yeah. um, some of these movies are really difficult for me to watch, but they existed and there was an audience for it. And, uh, you know, those movies can be looked through different lenses, too, which is always strange for me. Like, is I Spit on Your Grave? uh the worst movie ever because there's rape in it or she wins out and she, you know, uh, takes revenge. You know, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know. It's both actually, but right. last house on the left was really <laughs> uncomfortable for me to watch. And a lot of people call it a classic and that's one that bothers me a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. but yet on the same time, on the same token, exorcist doesn't, you know, and that's, that's got some really <laughs> Yeah, really. That's There's some messed up shit in that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like let's just say the cross stuff. I I, I, <laughs> I to get away with that, I, I, I can't even imagine them putting in that, that in a movie right now. And no. yet it was no. an Oscar nominee, you know, yeah. so tons of hype, you know, it was I mean, instant classic when it came out. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and you know, uh if you're covering that topic, I guess you have to show how bad it can get, you know? Yeah. Uh, right. Whether you believe in exorcisms, exorcisms or not, it was really well done. You know, it was mm -hmm. really well written. And one funny thing is uh, about that movie is Linda Blair. I always think like, I feel bad for her. She's a really nice person. And mm -hmm. she went down, like she made like the shittiest movies after that. And uh, <laughs> I love, no, personally, I love a lot of them. Like I, I, I'm all about, uh, Roller Boogie and some of those movies. Uh, Hell Night, I like. <laughs> Hell Night, yeah. I, was say that I don't know if it was her agent or what, but it, it seems like as soon as she did Exorcist 2, suddenly she was typecast in these roles, like Savage Streets Less, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and then, it, right. it, then suddenly you're really embedded into the horror scene, and it, it, it's hard to go back and forth, especially back right, then. Right, right. Yeah. I, oh, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> All right. Man, hey, you got sure. your back. All yeah, right, very yeah. cool. Was there a little little slip up there? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Everything good? You know what? I didn't expect to use my phone. I keep changing like the couch I sit on. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it's good. It's good. It's it's nice. It looks, you know, not nice and uh, and and welcoming as far as the light. So everything's good. <laughs> I'm so happy that I'm fr in front of like a white wall for you. <laughs> right. I actually have art up, but I can't, I don't want to stand in like the whole time. But, yeah, uh, yeah, anyways. for sure. All about comfort, buddy. As long as you're yeah. comfortable, that's good. All right, right. so we are going to okay. dig back into earlier. We talked a little bit about Planet Wax, this bad boy. All right, so what I want to dig on, on now is the record store day. So you said it's next Saturday, right? The 29th. 29th, it's Planet Wax. Uh, okay. And that Planet Wax, it comes with a signed bookmark. Uh, Aaron and Jeff, since the border is closed, they couldn't sign the actual book, so we sent bookmarks for them to sign. Okay. And then uh, it comes with a seven inch of unreleased music. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. that's what I want to hit on, dude. Mars. It's on, uh, it's by Christopher Young. He uh, gave us some music that was uh, never used for Invaders from Mars. It's on like a neon, well, uh, neon greenish type vinyl. And um, it's a great little piece. Um, I think everyone will love it that loves so Invaders from we got Mars or sci-fi. Absolutely yeah. awesome cover art. The Just cover art is by Hag Cult. So good. Yeah, she, yeah. She's really great. I don't know if you know her. She'd be great. Yeah. Uh, she, her style is so punk. And she does um, some of the official artwork for Vampira. Do you know Vampira? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. She's super cool. Uh, she's got a cool look to her. She's at all the shows. and But her style is really, really punk. Uh, the first piece I ever saw of hers was Rock and Roll High School. It was a Ramones like tribute. And uh, oh, yeah. Okay. She just nails it. She was in one of my books and she just nails it. Met her once. I uh, had dinner with her once. She lives in uh, Tennessee. And uh, she just nails it. That cover she did um, around the holidays, and we had to do it in 24 hours, and she did the front and back in 24 hours. Damn, really? Yeah, like that whole... <laughs> oh, my God. Like, complete original sketch. So uh, if you're wondering, th this, is, yeah, this is all the detail hours. in this bad boy. Yeah, and she gave me three different concepts and then colored it, and then we had three oh different God. colors going. Yeah, she's great. Holy shit. Yeah, I was going to show off, too, the, with the, the old Slimer, the old Slime Green yeah, Vinyl. Yeah, yeah. Dear Lord. So tell me about this process as far as – so the, my first experience with you guys was Blood on Black Wax. So we got that. I'm going to show that off, that, that bastard, yeah. that sexy bastard. Jesus Christ. But then, you, then it comes with Prom Night. So it's <laughs> got the 7-inch with it. Yeah, Blood, so blood Red like, Vinyl. Tell me about the process, you know, with, with how, you know, what was, what was different this time, you know, as opposed to the, the first time you guys were wanting to get a seven inch with it. Um, you know, just tell, tell me about how that all comes along yeah, for you. You know, um, that's a good question because basically Aaron and Jeff, they get really cl uh, close with the composers. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in, in the case of prom night, it's Carl uh, and Paul Zaza and Carl Zitter. And right. they did a lot of uh, music. Aaron and Jeff probably told you all about them. But basically, we get pretty close to the uh, composers in these interviews. And they usually, not slip, but they usually tell us in some of these interviews, like, oh, yeah, I did Invaders from Mars. And they scrapped half of the score that I did. So then, you know, we <laughs> well, yeah. talking. Right. And then we get, you know, like a small list of, like, cool ideas. And one was Invaders from Mars. And Christopher Young, the composer, who did, he's, he still does movies. I think he did... The new Pet Cemetery yep. and some others. Yeah, he'd be good to have on. Uh, drag he, me to hell. Yeah, drag me to hell. He still is on top of his game, and mm -hmm. uh, so he told us he had some new music. So then it's just all about how do we get the rights to this music, and we got the rights to the music, and he gave us basically enough to fill two sides of a seven inch, and uh, it's great music because Toby Hooper did Invaders from Mars, and the original idea was to have, I mean, he was brought on, uh, when he was brought on, Toby Hooper's original idea for Invaders from Mars was like a little bit darker. And it turned oh. into more of a family PG kind of movie. Right. So the music that was originally done by um, the original composer for the, the movie was darker in tone and more in line with, I mean, basically he saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre and then he heard, and the Fun House also. And then he, here he's making Invaders from Mars. And he did Poltergeist. 
Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, it's going to be in that vein. And he made music in that vein. And then they decided, oh, no, we're going to do like a PG or PG-13 kind of movie. So they scrapped it. So that's this is some of the music from that version. Man. Wow. That uh, that would have been interesting to see what I mean, what the differences would have been as far as, you know, the, the outcome of that. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those movies. I like it. It kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit. Invaders from Mars. Um, it almost could have been more in the horror direction but they went more in the sci-fi direction you know uh, i i gotta say other than texas chainsaw massacre and the you know the fun house you gotta love those and texas chainsaw massacre too invaders from mars is up there for one of I my like fa my favorite movies from him and then well, when you guys release or maybe it was had call i don't know who it was that first released the cover art for this though oh, i was yeah, like yeah, yeah. holy shit what yeah, is that really like great. lost my mind i was so yeah. so excited and then coming out yeah. for the book i'm like God damn it. That's awesome. So <laughs> sick. But <laughs> so you're so excited about it. You know, that movie, what's great about it, another Oscar winner, the, um, she won for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Her name slips me. But she was the uh, teacher in the movie, the one that eats a frog. Oh, you know, that's, damn. That's okay. a scene that I also think is super scary for a you know, PG sci-fi movie. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I love that movie. I think it's underrated. I think it's pretty good, Invaders yeah. from Mars. Um, Toby Hooper is kind of a weird guy because he did, you know, he started off doing Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then there were rumors that he didn't totally direct Poltergeist, and was he a good, good director or not? And then he did Texas Chainsaw 2, which was almost in the comedy vein. Mm -hmm. Funhouse was a horror movie. Uh, did you ever see Eaten Alive? Yeah, I was just going to say alligator, but it wasn't alligator eaten alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I wasn't, good too. A lot of people like that one. I don't, maybe I have to you revisit like one. I wasn't ever super into that one. You know, it's kind of, I like it because of Karen Black. So when I saw it, yeah. I also saw any crappy movie that I saw at age 10 in my kid <laughs> yeah. no. it's still there. <laughs> no, it's still there. And it's like good for some reason, just because yeah. I had access to it, I think. Okay, you know, right. Um, but anyways, Toby, Toby Hooper's great. And we thought, you know, even though this book's about sci-fi, we wanted to tap into the horror crowd a little bit. And we sure. thought, all right, this is a way to do that. You know, because Toby, he's, a, uh, he's known as a horror director. And mm -hmm. um, even though he directed Invaders from Mars, we thought that was a good seven inch to put in because it's, it's sci-fi, but a lot of horror fans still like it. Yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that cover alone, though. I mean... All we're charging is five more dollars for that seven inch for the record store day edition. That cover alone is it's frameable. She's so great. So sick. I, I yeah. abso absolutely, absolutely agree. That was, yeah. you know, it was already a selling point because there was another movie or, or another book that you guys were doing on, you know, movies and kind of the same, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the same vein. But then I saw that seven inch with it too. And I'm just like, oh shit, I'm about, I'm about to lose some teeth over this bitch if I don't fucking get it from <laughs> one of the stores. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad so, you did. I'm glad so excited. You, you didn't have to fight over it. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's one of those things I, I wish wish we had we don't have the rights to do the full twelve inch. That would be cool to do two. Sure. But um to have her reinterpret it as a twelve inch as well. I, I'd love to work with her again. She's great. She's really, yeah. really great. Absolutely. Yeah, she does uh, does really, really cool stuff. I uh, you know, and, and all the artwork too, you know, that's definitely a standout point of, you know, your stuff and, and even I was gonna hit on a little bit earlier. You're being a little bit modest, you know, as far as like for the money that you spend on these, you know, I didn't know, you know, from like the first one that I bought, I didn't really know, you know, as far as like the quality, these things uh, literally are just, they're fucking spectacular. They're no, one of those I things where that. it, you know, it might be like, you know, at first kind of seeming like a coffee table, you know, type book, but yeah, yeah. you just looking into all of the attention to detail and just the love and passion that goes into it from all of the characters, you know, from the first one that, that, you know, the first book that I've gotten, that's why I really wanted to reach out to all you guys, just because the creative minds behind this, you can tell that there's just the passion and the love behind it. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the shit out of it. And I know no, tons I of other people that. on the community do as well. Well, I'll be honest, you know, when I do a lot of shows, a lot of people just kind of quickly th flip through books, they look for their favorite movies, and then they buy it based on that. But you know, the covers are so important. And Shane did this cover. His style is super cool, too. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone should look up Shane Lewis. Like, his sketch style is really unique. And he really nails it. Um, 
uh, with the right properties, you know, like he does also a lot of, he's modest too, you know, he shows a lot of character art on his Instagram, but he does mm -hmm. really cool band stuff. He's working with some rappers now and hip hop artists and like he's being discovered as well. Hag Cult has a punk style. His is more like punk also, but horror and like death metal. Like that's kind of his, he does a really cool thing. He probably showed you on his segment, but he does a cool thing where he takes old magazines and draws over them. Did, did he tell you about that? Who is this? Shane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They're I love cool it. Cool as like, shit. Those are he'll awesome. He'll take like a, you know, like a Rolling Stone cover with Taylor Swift and like death metal it up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, and no, that's, that's another cool. thing too I have here uh, that you guys that you guys have on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, old zines, the man. Those things are zines. so just absolutely badass. I loved, you know, like looking through something like this and that touches, you know, along with my, my roots of being in like the hardcore and punk community too, is, you know, going in, or for instance, the band Deftones. I don't know if you, you listen oh, to yeah, them. Or Deftones if you're, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they got a new record coming out and they have a zine with it. You know, I'm just like, God, that is such a cool fucking thing. Like that's, yeah. you know, yeah, one of those yeah, things yeah, yeah. kind of goes back to later eighties, maybe nineties, you know, feel of like, Hey, you know, we got some t-shirts, but uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you know, as far as like having a book on hand, having a zine yeah. type thing, that's cool shit to have, man. Oh, and collectors were, love that stuff. If I were a band, whether it's Deftones or whatever, Blink-182 or Sum 41 or a, a new punk band or whatever, they should all have zines. You know, it's oh, something, yeah. not everyone brings 50 bucks extra. So everybody gets it like a tall boy for four bucks. And then, you know, to get a zine, those should cost two, three dollars and you can print them for 10 cents. Right. You know, I, in my mind, every artist should, that's a great way to get, you know, instead of having these like glossy postcards and stuff, like a zine <laughs> is the way to go. And whether it, the Shane zine that you just showed, that's kind of a high end, cool, slick zine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he still sold those for like five, 10 bucks. And, you know, uh, I'm sure it at least cost him three, four bucks to print, you know? Um, sure. but I like those old, even foldable zines that you keep or throw out or whatever. Those are super cool, but I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Is doing something like that. Um, very few bands like remember their beginnings. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if I was an artist, I would have a different show poster for, it's so easy to do. Like every show should have a different poster you should get with a local artist. You should show, sell those posters at the shows, you mm -hmm. know, um, silk screen them all. I mean, that's the way to go, in my opinion. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it was, just, it was another thing as far as quality wise, you know, as far as like the zines that I'm used to are, you know, like maybe four or five pages that were folded together folded. and all printed, you know, and I get yeah. this and I'm like, Jesus, H, yeah, they go yeah, all yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it used to be, but, it used to be if a zine was stapled, that was like, deluxe yeah you know what i mean that's now, uh, yeah, now not falling apart and shit you're like what page yeah, goes yeah, first yeah. <laughs> yeah it was true zines the old ones were like like newsprint you know what i mean like they disintegrated in your hands you mm -hmm. know? yeah yeah but, all copied together and just different pictures cut out and you know yeah, yeah 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 like legit cut and paste right <laughs> so let i guess as a, as a finale, you know, we've kind of dug okay. into tons of stuff and, and I've taken more than uh, what I asked of your time. I truly appreciate your time. No, no, no. Um, it's awesome. It's awesome. I, you know, I just wanted to give you this opportunity first to kind of pitch, you know, what you have going on, some, some, some different stuff and just let us know, uh, you know, what, what, what's going on in the world of uh, 1984 yeah. further. Okay. Planet Wax is next Sunday. Uh, so, you know, if you can't uh, afford it. Saturday or Sunday? Sunday? Sorry, Saturday, the 29th. Saturday. okay yeah uh 29th um they're doing like three record store day, day drops every record store is doing something different so basically i would suggest just call your local record store see if they'll have it in stock they'll probably just hold it for you and like you can do a a car drop or something like that you don't have to wait in line like you did last year at record store oh, okay um and then um if you don't grab it there you can just grab it anywhere you know you can order it through your local bookstore you could amazon whatever um blood uh the the weird al books cool if you're into him at all or if you're looking for a cool gift for like the holidays for a weird al fan it's called black and white and weird all over uh that comes out october 29th uh that's available everywhere already barnes and noble books whatever your local bookstore anywhere um and then i won't tell you the title yet but keep an eye out for the black 
Friday record store day list because we have a really cool uh, 12 inch full soundtrack that'll be coming out. It's for a horror movie that was released in 1984. And uh, there's, let's just say there's two bonus tracks on it that have never been heard before. So it's, 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 it's music that you've heard that you love. And then there's two bonus tracks that we unearthed. Basically, we went back to the original like writers and composers and two of them, uh, one of them found two more songs that were rejected for the movie and they're right in the, the vein of the movie. As soon as you see the title Dang. and you, as soon as you see the Gary pulling artwork, pulling artwork, you're going to love it. Uh, it's, oh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you more, but it's a 1984 horror movie. So that at least narrows it down to like 50. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we'll we'll leave it a surprise. I love it, man. I can't I yeah. can't wait. The anticipation is gonna is gonna kill for sure. Yeah, um, it's great. and I wanted to mention I'm gonna be doing I'm gonna be doing a fundraiser in October. You know, so yeah, I'm cool. putting up this video on YouTube as well. I'm doing a fundraiser, and you donated something. I'm not gonna say necessarily what yet, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. All of the stuff that's going to be included in it is going to be, you know, like pretty limited shit. So it's not things that, you know, you're going to be able to grasp on hand and it's going to be for a really good cause. So uh, in probably the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be announcing, you know, as far as what uh, what it's going to and, you know, what the prizes will be and everything. And uh, oh, I wanted awesome. to thank you, you know, face to face as far as really appreciating you no, know, no, your no. involvement in that. So for this finale question, I titled it Choose One. So okay. in this finale, basically... If you had any one character, and let's just, you know, to make it a little bit easier, say in horror, if you had any one character that you could develop a book around, you know, based on possibly actors that played them, uh, you know, just any one character from a horror movie, what would that be? Who would that be? Different portrayals, maybe action figures made of them, uh, you know. That's a great question. I, I like your questions because typically – the questions are so predictable and that's not a predictable question. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you know, I would love uh, one, but you said one character. I, I, I would love a book on all the kills of a certain series. Like what was it like to be killed in Friday the 13th? Uh, oh so that, shit. That's, that's not, awesome. That's, that's not one character though. But if I had no. to say one character in what was it like, The obvious, you know, on one hand, I would say Jason, but I think that's been overdone. I, you know, I've seen too many interviews with, you know, not, not, I like the guys, you know, but with Robert England and stuff like that. Sure. Um, you know who I really like, uh, who's great, if you ever met her, Felissa Rose from Sleepaway oh, Camp. Oh, yeah. Have you yeah, met yeah. her? I have not, she, no. She seems she great. Is, she's one of my favorite people, and she's a part, like, she'll be at the bar after the show, and, you know. She'll tell you all kinds of stories, not only about sleepaway camp, but other stuff she's been in. She's okay. one person that of all the actors and actresses that I've ever met, she's probably one of the most interesting people to talk to. But let me, hold on. okay, let's just say Leatherface, because even though he's gone, you know, uh, Gunner's gone, and I have his book and it's great. Mm -hmm. I always am intrigued by characters that have a mask on the whole movie. And then sure. what is it like yeah. when people find, like, for instance, and not just him as Leatherface, but Leatherface, one, two, three, four, anyone that has a mask, you know, what is it like for them to carry on and be, let's say, a teacher? And then <laughs> everybody <laughs> finds out that you're Leatherface. You know, Robert Cleveland's right. obviously, he's obviously, you know, Freddy Krueger. But, you know, for Kane Hodder, you know, or that someone who, who has a mask on, I always think that must be interesting because people meet them as a regular person. And then they right. have very deep opinions on horror movies and what is it like like gunner was a you know he was like a college educated really smart guy so yeah. he must have made a lot of friends like talking about philosophy or whatever and then to have it come out like oh yeah did you know i was you know leatherface and the most horrifying horror movie of all time <laughs> i think that's pretty cool i think that's pretty right cool. anybody then... anybody who played a character where they became like a white collar person and they were either a victim or whatever. I think that that must be the most bizarre, hilarious experience to work at the post office and then everybody <laughs> finds out you were victim number two in 
the fun house, <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, old Gunner over there sawing up the goddamn mail again. We can't get right, it out right, to our mailboxes. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, every, man, every I love guy that. Like that. Every guy like that eventually got, like, very few of them stayed in acting. Like, everybody's mm -hmm. got it. Like, D, even Dee Wallace, she's, like, a spiritualist now and does yoga and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, what is it like for her yoga people to find out that she's in the Rob Zombie movies. I think right, that's right. That's like hilarious in a way. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great answer. I love it. I love it. All and right. I, I would love to see something like that too. So if you're ever, you know, kind of scratching your head for some ideas, uh, maybe throw that one out there. Cause that would be sick. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be that. And it's going to be like shit, shitty movies with A-listers. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. <laughs> All right, man. Matthew, thank you so, so much. Man. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, appreciate the time. This has been absolutely amazing. And uh, I know we'll talk again soon, my man. Yeah, let's talk soon. And thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you much. All right. Talk my to man, you Matthew, 1984 Publishing, Lo-Fi Horror Guy. You guys take care. Stay safe. See you later. See All you, buddy. Right. Bye-bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, baby.